following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, it kills 50,000 Americans each year. Some people say, if I don't know about it, I don't have to deal with it. But you will eventually have to deal with it. And many of those cases can be prevented. Had I missed that opportunity, who knows what would have happened. Get the warning signs. If that happened to whoever, maybe I need to listen to what my doctors think. And find out how you can protect yourself from colon cancer. You have suddenly increased your chances to 100% survival. Today on The 700 Club. Well, welcome to The 700 Club. To bring prices down, the Federal Reserve has made a historic hike, approving the largest interest rate increase in nearly 30 years. Well, that means Americans will pay more to borrow money. The increase affects credit cards, car loans, mortgage rates. Wendy Griffith has more. As expected, Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell announced an interest rate increase of three quarters of a point, the biggest in nearly three decades. We at the Fed understand the hardship that high inflation is causing. The board pursuing a series of rate hikes to bring down record high inflation. However, those moves delivering another blow to consumers as it raises the cost of borrowing. Credit cards average APR is up over 20% for the first time. Mortgage loans were around 3% at the beginning of the year, now above 6%, pushing monthly payments hundreds of dollars higher. But the number one issue for most Americans remains the ever-increasing prices at the pump. Everything is going up except our paychecks, and this is, this is not right. President Biden blaming the war in Russia and oil companies for high gas prices. He sent a letter to seven oil executives threatening to invoke emergency powers if they don't increase production. His press secretary called on them to be patriotic. We are calling on them to do the right thing, to be patriots here, uh, and not to use the war uh, as an excuse or as a, as a reason uh, to, not put, to not put out a production. But Republicans say Biden has done everything he can to limit oil production in pursuit of his agenda to convert America to green energy. The president's executive orders have shut down the Extel pipeline. They have stopped uh, the issuance of more leases. They've stopped the pr progress on the permitting of those leases, stopped the offshore oil production. Uh, the well, fact is we were energy independent. Over the medium term, the critical thing is that we become more dependent on the wind and the sun that are not subject to geopolitical influences. The Fed is expected to raise rates again in July, causing concern of tipping the economy into recession. While economists say a recession is not for certain, many believe it's becoming more likely. Wendy Griffith, CBN News. And I'm one of those believing a recession is just around the corner. And if you look at the Federal Reserve notes, which is sort of a geeky thing to do, but if you look at them from yesterday's meeting, back in May, they, they said one of our goals is to maintain strong employment. They dropped that in yesterday's notes. Uh, so they're not trying to maintain strong employment. What they want above everything else is price stability. As a consumer, and particularly as a consumer of, of gas. You know, when you fill up your car these days, you just you kind of choke. Uh, I, I applaud that. But at the same time that we are going to tilt into a recession. What is going to happen is every CEO in the nation is going to start pulling back because they're looking at a very uncertain future. It's very hard to make determinations on return on investment in an unstable price environment. If all of your supplies to produce goods are going up, and they are because energy prices are the fundamental here, then you're going to pull back. That means you're not going to be hiring. Uh, that means a whole bunch of other things. So if you are employed, please uh, stay that way. The strong job market is literally going to evaporate in front of our eyes. Now, what should the average consumer do? Number one. Please get rid of all credit card debt. Once credit cards top 20% in interest, uh, that is an unbelievable um, amount. It, it, and if you roll that over month over month and year over year, it means you're double paying for everything you put on that credit card.
Now, I know in an inflationary environment, it's very tempting to do that because there's a whole lot more month than there is a paycheck. But please don't do that. Pay off that credit card because it will hurt you in the long run. The second is, if you have an adjustable rate mortgage, please look at the terms on that. With mortgage rates now at 6%, my prediction is the Federal Reserve isn't going to stop here at three quarters and say, we're done. They're going to continue to increase interest rates, which means if you're in one of those three-year or five-year or seven-year adjustable rate mortgages, uh, expect that mortgage payment to go way up. Now, when you, when you do have it go way up, you're not going to be able to sell in a very tight housing market because those interest rates are so high. Just a few months ago, long-term 30-year mortgages were in the 3% range. Today, they're in the 6% range. So say $400,000 of a mortgage, that's an extra $12,000 a year in mortgage payments. And you multiply that over the 30-year mortgage, that's 360000 That's a lot of money. Uh, and that's really going to discourage home buyers, particularly first-time home buyers. So if you're in an arm, uh, see if you can lock in. I know it may be difficult to say I want to lock in at six, but in what's it going to be two years from now, three years from now? I lived in the Paul Vocal, Vocal days, and he was the champion trying to have price stability. Uh, interest rates w w rose way above 15%. I mean, it was absolutely incredible. You could get a 30-year federal bond that paid 15%. Uh, so that, that, those are days where no one was able to buy a home because the interest rates were just sky high. That was what the Fed did, the Federal Reserve did to stop inflation. So look at history, look at what's coming, and please protect your own economy because it looks like the guys in Washington don't have a clue. In other news, close your doors or become a target. Pro-abortion radicals made this threat and declared open season on crisis pregnancy centers. Efren Graham has more from the CBN Newsroom. Efren? Gordon, the warning came in a statement released under the name Jane's Revenge. Those words have been found at the site of attacks against crisis pregnancy centers and other pro-life groups. The statement said, we are not one group but many and claim responsibility for attacks in more than a dozen cities. It goes on to say, from here forward, any anti-choice group who closes its doors and stops operating will no longer be a target, but until you do, it's open season and we know where your operations are. The Biden administration, which had been silent about the attacks, condemned the threat Wednesday. A White House press secretary told The Daily Wire, violence and destruction of property have no place in our country under any circumstances, and the president denounces this. 122 Republican House members sent a letter to Attorney General Merrick Garland calling for an investigation into these attacks. President Biden is using his executive authority to target state laws curbing LGBTQ initiatives in public schools, announcing an executive order that seeks to combat state laws prohibiting transgender athletes from participating in girls' sports and targeting policies like Florida's parental rights law that prevents discussion of sexual orientation or gender identity in grades K through three. It also directs federal agencies to expand access to, quote, gender affirming medical care for young people. Sexual abuse and holding offenders accountable played a major role in the Southern Baptist Convention's annual meeting this week. The nomination also elected a new president. He's a small church pastor and social media pro who arrives at an historic moment. Heather Sales has more on Pastor Bart Barber and his vision for the future. Barber did not mince words, calling predators wolves who are going after sheep in Southern Baptist churches. Sexual predators have used our decentralized polity to try to turn our churches into a hunting ground. And now Southern Baptists have signaled they're ready for reform. It's time for Southern Baptists to realize how nimble and resilient our Baptist polity can be.
to put sexual predators on notice that Southern Baptist churches are a dangerous place for them. At his first press conference, Barber cast a vision for taking on the predators while candidly acknowledging another denominational hazard in fighting. Every way that I've served Southern Baptists has left scars. Every way that I've done it. Hey, good morning, everybody. Bart Barber. Still, Barber is known for his relentless optimism that translates in person and online. He's positive. Um, he's encouraging. Bart just pulls out his phone and does videos every day. I think you're seeing a shift culturally in the convention and culture uh, where people are, some people even say more of a mini church movement, intimacy, things like that. Um, and so I think that BART resonates with a lot of this new generation of Southern Baptists. Shooting back to try to own them does not solve the problem. In a country worn down from a pandemic, politics and mass shootings, he's adamant that there's never been a better time to share the gospel. Barber's first priority is naming a new abuse task force. He's vowed to work quickly to build a diverse group that will recommend new reforms that Southern Baptists can consider. Reporting in Anaheim, Heather Sells, CBN News. The convention also presented 64 new missionaries for work overseas, and those messengers affirmed their commitment to continue spreading the gospel worldwide. The U.S. has long been a global leader in technology and innovation. Now, former Pentagon officials are sounding the alarm. China is rapidly catching up. And if we don't take action now, we could lose our advantage. CBN national security correspondent Caitlin Burke reports. There's a high-tech battle going on between the U.S. and China with much at stake. Now experts are speaking out, concerned the U.S. isn't currently competing enough to come out on top. We're getting behind in really the sectors in cyber and AIML that are the most important to win the next battle. Nick Chalon filled the role as the first chief software officer of the Air Force and Space Force. He resigned last September over his concern regarding U.S. complacency. You see China, for example, doing 200 hypersonic launches versus 10 in the United States. That's obviously very alarming. And then you hear the chairman of the Joint Staff say that it's only a, almost a Sputnik moment. That's a sort of a clear example of risk taking and speed that China's been taking, uh, whereas the risk aversion uh, that we have here to be able to experiment and try something new on the government side uh, has been a real challenge. Preston Dunlap is another high tech defense official who basically followed Chalant's lead. Dunlap served as the inaugural chief architect officer of the Air Force and Space Force, and both men agree that to maintain technological dominance, the U.S must act now. When it comes to the compounded evolution of AI, there's a point where you can't physically catch up because we're dealing with a nation of 1.4 billion people, massive volume of data, and the more data you get in AI, the better the AI can learn and get better and stronger with time. I do think now is the, the time to uh, begin to pivot uh, and change that curve because it takes a while to turn an aircraft carrier. It takes a while to turn the technological uh, pace that we have here in the nation. Chalant estimates that if tremendous progress isn't made within the next six months, keeping up won't be the issue. The U.S. will face the challenge of catching up. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Washington. Certainly don't want to get in a situation of catching up, Gordon. Uh, I think we're already there. The, the um, hypersonic missiles that they uh, launched, uh, it, it caught the entire defense establishment in the United States by surprise. They had no idea that China was even working on that technology. And then they um, detected this launch, and it was a missile that could come from our southern border, uh, which would be uh, unable to be tracked by anything we currently have. Everything we have is designed to uh, cover things that are coming from the North Pole, and for things to come in from the South was a complete surprise. So it it's, shouldn't be a shock to anyone that we're behind China in this technological race for effective AI. And is it six months? Is it 12 months? What is this time frame? Uh, I don't think we have a really good idea. Under the current administration, though, we seem to be cutting defense spending. And when you do that in an inflationary environment, it's like a double cut. So are we going to see any kind of change coming out of Washington? Don't hold your breath. Terry?
Well, still ahead, a mother of three who is shooting up meth every single day. She was also working in the sex industry. See the total transformation that turned this former stripper into a children's church leader. That's coming up. Plus, good news for people who may be at risk for colon cancer. A home test that could increase chances of survival to 100%. Stay tuned for the details after this. It kills more than 50,000 Americans each year. Colorectal cancer is on the rise, especially among younger people. The good news? A home test kit for early detection is now available. Medical reporter Lori Johnson brings us the details. Record numbers of young people are being diagnosed with colon or rectal cancer. According to doctors, that's largely due to lifestyle choices, such as a diet high in red meat and processed foods, obesity, lack of exercise, and smoking. <laughs> While this cancer affects all groups, African Americans are as much as 40% more likely to die from colorectal cancer than others. Fortunately, that could be changing. Here at Trinity Baptist Church, a predominantly black congregation in Columbus, Ohio, parishioners learn how to prevent early death from colon cancer so they can serve the Lord on this side of eternity as long as possible. Assistant Pastor Janet Shepard's family has worshiped here for five generations, which can be common in these pews. This is our home and has been our home for a long time. What's not so common here is Janet's decision to get a colonoscopy, a procedure that can detect actual cancer or precancerous polyps. Some people say, if I don't know about it, I, I don't have to deal with it, but you will eventually have to deal with it. Janet's procedure revealed three precancerous polyps, which were removed during the same colonoscopy. Without that screening and discovery, the polyps would likely have grown into tumors, possibly even taking her life. Had I missed that opportunity, who knows what would have happened. Those polyps would have remained. We don't know if they would have turned to cancerous. They're precancerous, but they would have remained in my body and had the potential. During worship, Janet passes out blue colorectal cancer awareness ribbons and shares her testimony, hoping others will follow her lead. When you talk about it from the pulpit, when you talk about it in your circles around church and that type of thing, people listen and it's like, wow, if that happened to Reverend Jan, if that happened to whoever, maybe I need to listen to what my doctor's saying. I said the first miracle he did was at a wedding when he turned water to wine. Senior Pastor Victor Davis believes it's totally appropriate for spiritual leaders to give medical advice at church. It is not just a place where you come in fellowship and worship, but it's also a place where you receive resources that you might be able to go back and serve the community better. He adds that leaders of black churches in particular carry a responsibility to protect their congregation's health. The African-American population in many cities um, oftentimes is the population that does not have access um, to the information that is needed so that they might get the health care that they need. When it comes to getting a colonoscopy, there can be roadblocks, such as the procedure cost, no transportation, someone to accompany them, or the ability to take off work. As a potential solution, Ohio State University started a program using home test kits, not to take the place of a colonoscopy, but to cheaply and easily identify those who should make it a priority to get a colonoscopy and those who may wait. When you take a home test, you put a stool sample in this little container and mail it to the lab, which can detect microscopic traces of blood in the stool, a red flag for colon cancer. Some Trinity members are receiving the tests and urged to take action if needed. This is an opportunity to receive and be tested in a private, uninvasive way. 
and that if it comes back positive, you can take the next step. This is a preliminary opportunity for you to get control on your health and know what's going on in your body. Dr. Sabankar Chakraborty, a program developer, says the goal is to motivate those in the earliest stages of colorectal cancer to get a colonoscopy, rather than waiting until they possibly experience symptoms such as visibly bloody stools and other unusual bowel activity, abdominal pain, or sudden weight loss. And once they are diagnosed at later stage, then the, the risk of death is high. For example, if you got diagnosed with stage four colorectal cancer, there is a 90% chance that you will not survive for five years. But imagine if you get, uh, if you get a colonoscopy and you get uh, precancerous polyps removed, you have suddenly increased your chances to 100% survival. Dr. Chakraborty says people not involved in the program can order home tests online. He reiterates those who get a positive test should schedule a colonoscopy, adding the often dreaded PrEP isn't as bad as it used to be. The good news is there are several what we call low volume PrEPs, so you don't have to drink as much as you used to do before. And there's little to no pain. So there are sedation techniques with uh, where you can be just completely asleep, pretty comfortable, and when you wake up, you're all done. So while home test kits and colonoscopies aren't anyone's idea of a good time, doctors say they're definitely worth the effort because they could save your life or the life of someone you love. Lori Johnson, CBN News. And we want to be all about saving life. If you want to learn how you can get a home test kit, you can visit our website, cbnnews.com. You should also pay attention to your diet. Uh, diet has a very definite impact on the, these cancer rates. And so get informed and please stay healthy. Tara? Well, coming up, never recreational, always a necessity. That's how this mom described her out of control drug addiction. She lost custody of her children and could have lost her life. See what happened instead when we come back. A lot of attention and all eyes on her. That's what lured Liberty Taylor into the sex industry. She had to get high in order to do her job. And before long, Liberty had a raging drug addiction. So how did this former stripper wind up a children's church leader? See for yourself. I learned about snorting methamphetamines and then smoking it out of a pipe. And then eventually the methamphetamines was going in a needle and I started shooting methamphetamines into my veins every single day. At 21 years old, Liberty Crouch Taylor was a mother of three. She was also an addict. Liberty's childhood was far from happy and carefree. As a three-year-old, she was sexually abused by a babysitter then again at the age of five. During that time, her parents divorced, leaving Liberty rejected, confused, and longing for love. I don't know that I could put love in the same sentence with relationship at that point, or even really consider what would love be. The chaos in her heart and mind expressed itself in rebellion and anger. Before she was even a teenager, Liberty decided to end her life. I just hated my life. I didn't understand it. I, I hated myself, hated everyone. I took a whole bunch of aspirin. I wanted to go to sleep and never wake up. By the time I realized I'm not dead, I'm not dying, I'm not gonna die, I woke up like, why am I still here? What am I gonna do now? In her teens, she thought she found love in a sexual relationship. By 16, she had her first child. Then at 18, she found financial security as a stripper. Working in the adult entertainment industry, I got a lot of attention and I got paid to have all eyes on me. To calm her nerves, Liberty began snorting cocaine. In order to do my job, I have to get high. And the more cocaine, I'd make even more money. It went from just making money to now making it a career into now making it a lifestyle. At 21, after the birth of her third child, 
Liberty dove even further into drugs, using ecstasy and LSD. When she found out her boyfriend had cheated on her, she needed an escape. I just decided I'm not doing life anymore. And I went to a familiar drug dealer and I stayed at this one drug house, getting high, traveling to Miami, traveling wherever I wanted to go to work at the clubs, to make money, did more drugs, just carefree. I forgot about my family. Uh, I forgot about everything. Two years later, she wanted to get clean. She reunited with her children and moved to her father's home in North Carolina. However, she brought her addictions with her. Now she was shooting up meth. It was never recreational. It was more of a necessity. But then, you know, of course, I had my kids. So I'm doing it all undercover, so I thought. When the father of her children found out she was using, he called the Department of Child Services. I had to say, kids, you're going to go with your dad now, and I'll see you in a little bit. That was hard. On July 4th, 2010, Liberty showed up at her father's house, suffering from meth withdrawals. Overcome with her circumstances, she prayed. I didn't know what to do. I just looked all around and it's so quiet and peaceful. And I dropped to my knees and I said, God, if you're real, help me. Over the next few years, Liberty got completely sober. One night, she found a Bible in some of her belongings. And I opened it up, and I started flipping through the pages. And in the back of this little Gideon's Bible, it says something like, if you want Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior, you know, say these scriptures, believe in your heart, confess this with your mouth. And I believed in my heart and confessed, Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And Jesus is the God of the Bible. God is saving me. He's bringing this new life to me, just like that. Today, Liberty has been sober for 12 years. She's reunited with her children and is active in her local church. I remember there were times nobody would trust me with anything. Now I'm a key holder of much. And today I'm a children's church leader. I mean, talk about redemption. The love and acceptance Liberty always longed for was finally found in a relationship with Jesus Christ. I found acceptance and love in Christ. I found that everything I had been searching for, truth and love, is, is found in, in the love of Christ, is found in the person of Jesus. I know today that I am an heir of righteousness. I know today that I'm a child of God. I am accepted. I have been adopted into His family. I have just found He is true and He's faithful, that God is who He says He is. No, Liberty didn't know who God said He was when she first started out on that journey of trying to figure out who she was and what life was all about. There's a name for feeling disconnected from life and relationships and, and even values. It's called having an orphan spirit. And that's what she had. Who am I? Why am I here? What is this all about? Nothing makes sense. And then she gets with the wrong crowd. That's what happens very, very often when we're just searching ourselves in the midst of the chaos of everything around us. And you know, you start with a little bit here and then it's a little more here to make that workable. And then you've got to do something over here so that this is possible. And pretty soon you are a full blown addict. And it's not you taking the drug anymore. The drug has control of you. Some of you have been down that road. Some of you may be struggling with it right now. But what I can tell you is Jesus said he came to set the captive free. We can be captive to lots of things in our lives but it's very easy to be captive to drugs. That's the whole point and purpose of that. And somebody else is making money off of your addiction. And it just keeps, takes you deeper and deeper. You know that, that adage, you know, drugs will take you where you never thought you'd go. They'll keep you longer than they, you ever thought you'd stay. And they'll cause you to do things you never thought you'd do. That is the truth. 
It's always difficult to understand how someone can get through all of those losses before you wake up one day and say, God, if you're real, come into my heart and life. The interesting part of that is it doesn't matter what you've been through. It doesn't matter how long the drugs have held you. It doesn't matter how far down you've gone. God's waiting for you. And so today, if you find yourself with an addiction to alcohol, an addiction to drugs of some kind, an addiction to pornography, whatever it might be, an addiction to gambling, it's never too late. Sometimes you can feel like there's something in you, something that doesn't allow you the freedom to make that decision. Make the first best choice. Don't try to fix yourself. If that was possible, you'd have fixed yourself a long time ago. You can't do it. So do what Liberty did. Interesting, that's her name, isn't it? Because she found freedom in Jesus. Just get down on your knees and humble yourself and say, Jesus, I'm done. I, can't, I am undone. I can't do this anymore. I don't know how to get out from under this. I need help. I need you. And you know, as you listen to Liberty list all the things she knows she is now at the end of her story, it's because she's in a relationship. It's not just like something happened like that and she got set free and bada boom, everything's great and you go back to life as you'd hoped it would be. No, you enter into a relationship with Jesus Christ, a relationship that has daily content, that has meaning, Someone who cares about you, who's never going to leave. Someone who's not judging you. They're wanting the best for you. There's nobody else you're going to find that with. So get down on your knees like she did and humble yourself. Just say, Jesus, I've blown it. And I'm done with all of this mess. I need you. And I want you. You see, Jesus wants you. He wants you. He's been waiting. So now receive that and just invite him into your life. It's really that simple. He's just waiting for you to say you're done doing your thing and you're ready to have him be in control, be the Lord of your life, the savior of your soul. Ask him for those things and then thank him. Thank him that he has responded because his grace and his mercy exceeds anything you've done, any place you've gone. Just give it to him right now. Let him change you. Ask him for the power of his Holy Spirit to invade your mind, your heart, your actions, the way you think and see things. Ask him to change you in Jesus' name. His commitment to you is that he will respond to that. If you pray a prayer like that and you want to know, okay, now what? I've invited Jesus into my heart. How do I, how do I follow him? How do I live for him? We've got a great packet that's been put together just for you. It's called A New Day, filled with wonderful information on how to walk in this new life with Jesus. It's free. So is the phone call to receive it. 1-800-700-7000. Just call and say, I prayed the prayer. I'd like the New Day packet. We'll get it out to you right away. Gordon? Still ahead, a two-seam fastball. That's Craig Stammon's go-to pitch. The Padres relief pitcher throws every ball like it's the last out of the World Series. He'll tell you how he handles the pressure. That's coming up. Welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. The U.S. is sending $1 billion in new military aid to Ukraine. It is the biggest military commitment made so far in the defense against the Russian invasion. The deal includes ammunition for rocket systems and another first, American harpoon and anti-ship missiles. Meanwhile, the relatives of two American veterans who are missing in Ukraine are asking the U.S. government to help find them. It is feared they've been captured by Russian forces near Kharkiv. More than a dozen U.S. cities set daily high temperature records Wednesday. Macon, Georgia hit 103 degrees. That's three degrees higher than the previous record set back on June 15th in 2010. At least 16 U.S. cities set or tied records for their highest temperature for the date. Chicago O'Hare Airport reported a temperature of 96 degrees, 15 degrees above normal 
and it was 95 in Tampa, Florida, equaling a mark set back in 2001. The Weather Service says more than 120 million people were under heat warnings or advisories. I want to remind you, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Gordon and Terry are back with much more of today's 700 Club. It's coming up right after this. Picking weeds for food, that's how desperate a widow in Cambodia became. After the COVID lockdowns, it was impossible for her to feed her family. Here's how you help save them all from starving. Ten-year-old Sorm Tier and her family have faced hard times ever since the COVID pandemic hit the nation of Cambodia. When COVID hit, mom lost her job at the factory we didn't have food to eat. Sorm Tier's mother, Savan, is a widow. It was difficult during that time. I could only find enough money for us to eat once a day. I sold my earrings for money to buy food. The most difficult time was when the country was locked down. I had to go pick weeds to make food. This is Grandma So Peep. We were poor before the COVID-19 outbreak. Some days, I earned a little planting rice, but it still was not enough for food for my grandchild. Sorm Tier had been attending Superbook classes at a church in their community before the lockdowns. She prayed to become a Christian and actually helped her whole family to become Christians too. Her pastor contacted Operation Blessing to tell us about the family's need for food. We delivered food packs to them on three different occasions. Thank you for helping us in our time of need. I am speechless. Thanks for the food you gave to us. My family had enough to eat. I ask God to bless those who help us. Now our lives are better thanks to you. That blessing from a widow in Cambodia is going right to you if you're a member of the 700 Club. Thank you. Because you cared enough to give, we were all able to provide her family what they needed. Not just a handout, but a hand up. If you're not a member, I ask you to join with us and say, yes, let's help people. Let's join with tens of thousands of people that want to make a difference in the world. It's real simple. All you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. Say, I want to join the 700 Club. You can also go on CBN.com. We have a new thing, and you can text to give. You can text CBN to 71777. Now, when you text to give monthly, or you go to CBN.com and, and, and sign up for our monthly pledge, or you can call us and ask for a monthly pledge, uh, you'll sign up for what we call Pledge Express. It's electronic monthly giving, bank doing all the work, the no checks to write, nothing to mail in and your gift comes in regularly every single month. We can send as our gift to you Power for Life monthly teaching CDs. So if you'd like those, uh, you can get a CD or you can get the download either way. Call us and say, yes, I want to be a part of it. I want to be a member of Pledge Express. 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, up next, San Diego Padres pitcher Craig Stammen. See why he says the biggest challenge to pitching lies in his head, not in his hand. We'll be right back with that. Plus, we're going to be answering your email questions after this. Anxiety and fear of failure. They go hand in glove with playing professional baseball. So what's the antidote for Padres pitcher Craig Stammen when he takes the mound? Craig shared his secret and much more with sports reporter Tom Beering. At center stage of the infield, Craig Stammen finds a rare perspective with a lasting pitch. To be able to challenge yourself out on the mound and be able to take on the best players in, in the world. You're out to prove yourself, out to prove that you belong. Whatever happens on the baseball field, it's not gonna matter knowing that Jesus says yes to you in heaven. The San Diego Padres middle reliever and spot starter shoulders a heavy load of innings as the team's durable, effective, and savvy veteran. What is the one pitch that served you well over the years? 
It's my sinker, my two seam fastball. It's when I get in a sticky situation, nine times out of 10, that's what I'm going to. Not necessarily always for the strikeout, but I know it's an effective pitch that I can locate. It gets a lot of outs for me. I've been blessed to be able to have a lot of movement. It just comes and tails and drops five, six inches right at the last end, and they usually beat it into the ground for a ground ball. Is it difficult for you to surrender the ball and release its results? <laughs> I think that's the only way to pitch or to be sane while pitching. Really, the only thing that I can control is got the grip, got our mindset on throwing that pitch exactly where we want to at that time, and we let it go. You've got to throw everyone like it's the you know, last out of the World Series. A performance-based business, where did your affirmation come from? It's a good question. You know, I like having success on the mound. I'm working hard to have that success, but I know the results aren't determining whether or not I'm a beloved child of God. So I think remembering that on a constant daily basis, being strong in the word and understanding the real truth gives you a whole lot more peace and joy when you're out there being able to do something that God has blessed you to do. You come alongside young pitchers to help them mute that voice of doubt. What do you do to reaffirm that voice of belief? Yeah, and it's probably the hardest thing to do with baseball. We all think it's physical out there on the mound, but most of it's in our head. And you know, to get rid of that doubt is basically how you find success and knowing that you can trust the abilities that you work on on a daily basis. It's fun to just go out there and use them and see if they're good enough. What is a small town Ohio guy like best about playing in San Diego? <laughs> it's different, you know, and both worlds are the best. I can go back to Ohio and live in that small town and be in the middle of nowhere, have nothing but a cornfield in front of me, or I can come back to San Diego, get to play in the sunshine, the beach, anything at your disposal, play golf whenever you want, and be at this beautiful park, Petco Park. You realize the vast blessings uh, this world provides. The ultimate professional in a clubhouse setting. Yeah. To be a leader there, wh wh what is it? I think authenticity is the number one trait that I like to have within the clubhouse and my friends and family. I hope that who I was when I was 21. Personality-wise, the same guy I am after so many seasons in the major leagues. I am who I am, and I want to be authentic, and that attribute has definitely helped me be a leader amongst my peers and help them feel more comfortable when they're around me. What is it about Jesus Christ, Craig, that has impacted your life? It's turned into my whole entire life. When you're younger, you think of it as an aspect of your life. And I think when I truly became a follower of Christ is when it became a part of every part of my life. Anything that I did, do, will do, ever do, centered around Jesus and his unconditional love. The importance of how I grew up in the faith, Jesus being at the top of everything, a part of everything that we did, how my parents raised me, has been the greatest gift that I've ever been given. Second Timothy 1.7. God did not give us a spirit of fear. That verse I say to myself right before the inning starts on the mound. There's a lot of anxiety. There's a lot of fear of failure that goes along with baseball. You know, Timothy, you know, he was known for being timid and he had to be stronger in his faith to be able to proclaim the good news to the new Christians of that time. And so my little piece of that is out there on the mound. I've got to have that faith that I know who my savior is. Boy, words of wisdom from a guy who is in the limelight, who has a lot of focus on him and has to figure out how to do that in a way that releases him from the pressure of that and honors God. Good word. Good word. Successful good guy. Word. Yes. Okay, some email questions. Okay. You ready? You ready to answer? Heck no. I'm giving these to you. <laughs> Okay. How do you really feel, Terry? I'm not getting that. <laughs> Pretty strongly. Okay. This is Jerry who says, Hi, Gordon. Can you suggest your best advice on reading God's Word? Is there a good order to read the epistles, Psalms, Proverbs, Old Testament? Or do I just ask God to lead me where to read? I've been a Christian for years, but I'm usually not sure where I should read and how much. Uh, Jerry, I would encourage you to really get to know the Gospels uh, and start with the Gospel of John. Uh, that's the gospel of love. But the more you learn about Jesus, his life, his teachings, uh, the better Christian you're going to be. The whole goal of being a Christian is to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. And what better way to do that than to read his actual words in the gospels? Uh, once you, you've gotten to a point where, okay, uh, I've, I've, I've done that, I think the epistles, and particularly the prayers in the epistles, 
uh, are really good to uh, learn, memorize, repeat, let them inform your prayer life. Then Psalms, uh, when you get the understanding that Psalms are actually prayers, um, and that will enrich your prayer life and give you a whole wide range of prayers and things um, to, to come to God with, and, and how do you come to God? Proverbs is full of wisdom, um, and, and that's something I, I know people that read a proverb every single day uh, and have done that for years in an effort to incorporate that wisdom into their daily life. I like Bible reading plans, too, where you read through the Bible in a year. Uh, it's just a couple of chapters a day, and if you're uh, regular with it, and do it every single day. You find that you can read through the Bible in a year, and the more you read that, and the more you read the Bible and incorporate those wonderful stories into your life, uh, it really helps you walk the Christian life. So um, do all of it, and do it in abundance, and observe what the Torah instructs us to bind it on our foreheads and on our forearms and put it on the doorposts so that we're reminded when we go out and when we come in. Uh, meditate on the Word day and night. Uh, the more you read the Bible, the better Christian you're going to be. Well, this is Joel. Joel says, I would like to know what you think of college social fraternities and sororities. Are they unfairly stereotyped? Can you tell me about your college experience? In, in my college, we didn't have um, fraternities or sororities. Uh, we had what were called residential colleges. Uh, and in that, you were kind of thrown randomly. It wasn't, um, you, you, you weren't pre-selected for it. There wasn't some sort of initiation. Uh, and in that residential college, you really got to know one another, and I made some lifelong friends in that process. Uh, I think fraternities and sororities can be beneficial for that. Uh, you, you have lifelong fr friendships. My sister was involved with one, and uh, she goes to their reunions, and she made some very fast friends. Um, in today's college environment, uh, fraternities are remarkably famous for being uh, almost bacchanal in their um, uh, drinking. It's, uh, it's just this, you know, huge uh, drinking thing. And, and, and so ha ha have they gotten away from we're trying to create brotherhood, because uh, that's what fraternity means. Are, are, are we trying to do that? Or are we just trying to have a big beer party? Uh, so uh, I'm, not, I, I, I'm not that familiar with what, what, what's, what's going on. I've just heard the legends of it, and uh, it's something I, I, I can't possibly endorse that. This is Sarah, who says in one place in Scripture it says Judas hanged himself, but in another place it says his gut burst open. Why the seeming contradictions? Thanks. Love both shows. Uh, once in, uh, the hanging is in the Gospel of Matthew, the, uh, you know, thrown into the field and his uh, belly burst and his guts spill out into the field. That's in the book of Acts. Uh, you, you can reconcile it. Theologians have reconciled it, that the hanging happened. And then because whoever is hung on a tree is cursed, you couldn't bring him down. And therefore, his body began to rot, and the, it, it eventually fell into the field. And because it was beginning to rot, uh, his, his guts burst open, uh, which is a remarkably grotesque description of what happened to the body of Ju Judas. But that's how theologians reconcile those two passages. Uh, we're out of time for... We're out of time, but we love hearing from you all. Um, so anytime you want to send your questions... We, we can talk about rotting so. bodies on another day. I know Terry's looking forward to it. <laughs> we leave you today with these words from Philippians. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow.